Good morning and welcome to To The Point. To say that it has been a trying week in Lansing would be an understatement. It has been difficult for members of the legislature as they dealt with two of their own. One of the people who had a front row seat, maybe not a seat he selected, but had a front row seat nonetheless, was Representative Rob Verhulen. Representative, thank you for being here. I know that you are sleep deprived. I know it has been a very long week. And as we are airing this on Sunday morning, the, the facts that we know now are that Representative Cindy Gamrat from Plainwell was expelled from office. Representative Todd Corser from Lapeer resigned. The net effect is that there are two districts, three if you count the Brandon Dillon seat here in Grand Rapids, that don't have representation. We're going to address all of that coming up. But let's start with the fact that you were selected to be on that select committee to look into the fitness of the two to serve. Tell me what the charge of that committee was because I think people know. I know people have a misunderstanding of how this process worked and in fact I and some of my colleagues were playing catch up because thankfully in all the years that I've covered the legislature I've never had to deal with this particular issue. Well, I hope you never have to deal with it again. I hope I never have to deal with it. You said, you said a minute ago this was a tough vote. This was, uh, I've been in public life uh, 11 years as mayor in Walker, and I'm now in my second term in the state house. And as I reflect on it, this was probably the most painful vote that I've ever had to cast on and, anything. And, and we will talk about the, the detail of that, too, because you had some very, I thought, some very insightful thoughts about it. But let's go back to the committee. The select committee was established by the House to do what? It, it was quite specific and the, the House resolution that was adopted was House Resolution 129 and because I'm very sleep deprived I actually brought a copy of it <laughs> and I'm looking at it and the, and, the, and the purpose was specifically quote to examine the qualifications of Representative Cindy Gamrat and Todd Corser and determine their fitness to continue holding the high office to which they were elected. That was the standard, and I carried a copy of the resolution with me to every meeting. Uh, as, as, you, as you know, we were provided with 836 pages of documentation and so forth, and I kept a copy of the resolution uh, with me at all times, and I would refer to it and say, trying to go through it and judge this, this standard, not, not uh, whether these are good individuals or bad individuals, whether I like them personally or I don't like them personally, but what are their qualifications uh, and fitness to continue holding the office in, in view of the facts. And that is where some people got off track because this wasn't a court of law. This wasn't finding them guilty of a particular instance. This was about should they be allowed to remain in the body of 110, 129 <coughs> I guess as it is, and 107 as it is as we sit here now. But should they be allowed to stay in the body? Were they capable of representing the 90,000 people that uh, the majority of which that voted in the last cycle elected them to office? And so this wasn't really about any of the other things that we heard a lot about. It was about were they able to continue and be effective at their job? That's exactly right, because uh, each one of us in the House is elected by 90,000 people. And, and that's a very significant thing. And, and the decisions made early this morning uh, undid, in one respect, the vote of 90,000 people. On the other hand, those 90,000 people are, are entitled to adequate and effective representation. And that was really the question. And we have an obligation to the, to the, uh, uh, the faith of the public in the institution of the House of Representatives. Public faith in government is critical if our democracy is going to flourish. And so the question was what damage to that, uh, to that faith in government and, and what damage would there be, if any, to allow these representatives to continue in their capacity? There were four Republicans, you being one of them, two Democrats on this panel. You met for a number of days. I know you had other conversations, but you had public hearings where both Representative Gamrat and Representative Corser were allowed to talk. You had the opportunity to interview or question them during that time period. You had the report that was done by the House Business Office, as you say, 800 plus pages. But Really, the summary that was released first was kind of the overview of everything that was in that report, and that's what you dealt with. 
So when you went in to sit down on that first day, when you were having those hearings, you had a couple of different options. You could have voted, I, I assume you could have voted to do nothing. Yes. You could have voted to censure. Yes. Recommended that. Recommended. Or you could have recommended, as you ended up doing, recommended that they both be removed from office. How? Uh, just, just uh, not, sure. not to correct you, but there is a, a, a lesser. There's a, sure. also a reprimand. Oh, okay. Which is uh, lesser than a censure. Censure allows the imposition of conditions, mm -hmm. uh, uh, financial penalties, and so forth. Yeah. So, and well, I think that's a, a distinction because it, it's not like there was a. Uh, the point that I was trying to get to was that there was not a predetermined course that you guys were going to take when you went in there. So that's why you had these hearings. No, that's that's exactly right. That was the menu. In fact, mm -hmm. we received a memorandum, uh, or a memorandum identifying that these are the p options. Well, as you said, w one would be simply to say, we recommend nothing. Right. Uh, we could have recommended a reprimand. We could have recommended a, a censure, or we could have recommended expulsion. And and as as you know, uh, both representatives uh, uh, they didn't seek. Uh, ask us to do nothing. They didn't ask for a reprimand. They both rec requested that we consider censure rather than expulsion. And in fact, uh, a recommendation, which certainly not binding, but the House Business Office or the investigators for the House said that they thought that might have been appropriate for Representative Gamrat, but you on the, the panel decided elsewise. No, that, that's true. The, the recommendation, it was a joint uh, recommendation from the General Counsel of the House mm -hmm and the House Business Office, which was the investigating agent, as, you, as it were, that in it, the, the House Business Office, which for your, for your viewers is a nonpartisan, it's a permanent bureaucracy within the House of Representation. It's not Republican, it's not Democrat, <coughs> and they manage the business affairs of the House of Representation. Representatives. So, so <coughs> now you're, you're up there and you're ready to begin. You uh, are by profession an attorney. I am. So. Uh, that certainly assisted you, I would assume, as you moved through this, at least understanding the finer points of the legalities and, and the purpose. But what was it like being on the other side of that panel, sitting in judgment of two of your peers? Because as, as you pointed out earlier, the, the vote that you had to take was very difficult, particularly when it came to removing uh, a, a colleague from office. But just being on that panel had to be a bit of a weight, I suspect. Well, well, it was. I, I mean, it was. Uh, uh, I, I did not volunteer for this. I, uh, the speaker, called me and asked if I'd be willing to serve, and I said, "Well, quite frankly, I would. I would prefer not. It's very distasteful for me to try to, to sit in judgment of another represent representative." And uh, he said, "Well, that's part of the reason why I want you. You don't want to be there, so I would like you to be there." And I said, "Well, I can't. I can't say no, but I'm not looking forward to this." Um, but it was very uncomfortable. I mean, it's uh, uh, particularly given the, the circumstances and the facts. Uh, uh, as, as you know, we had uh, surreptitiously recorded conversations, and while the facts uh, were very helpful in forming a conclusion, um, I felt, uh, I wouldn't say violated, but I felt like I was eavesdropping. Uh, it, uh, it, it, you're, you're not invading privacy because from a legal matter, there's nothing illegal right. about it, but it just, well, it's very distasteful. And yeah, it's, uh, and so people understand we're in a big room. This is in the appropriations room. So this is one of the bigger meeting rooms over at the state capitol. Yes. Um, and by the way, people said, oh, I bet it was a packed house. It never was. I mean, there really were not that many uh, folks other than media uh, that showed up. But nonetheless, it's a big room. And at one point, at the request of the committee, for an hour and 20 minutes or something like that, one of these recordings was played. And as I said in my story that day, most of us had heard at least parts of that already. But there was something eerie about sitting in that big cavernous room, hearing these two people talk about some very uncomfortable situations um, over those loudspeakers, and it went on and on and on. So I know what you mean when you say you, it, 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 it felt like you were almost doing something wrong by listening, not, again, not that you yeah. were. And the, and the impact of, of, of listening was, was huge. And, and when it was done publicly at the hearing room was probably the third time I'd listened to those. Uh, uh, the, the six members of the committee were given a, 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 
a copy or a disc to, to listen to this. And, and I, I listen to all of the conversations that have been recorded multiple times. And still, uh, the impact was, was huge. And, and uh, you, you know, it's, uh, people talk about, well, uh, we should have done more, more investigation. But, but those, those conversations uh, recorded um, uh, were, were very powerful. And, and it's better than someone's recollection of a conversation. We actually, it was as if we were in that, you know, a, a fly on the wall, so to speak. Uh, but it was very uncomfortable. When you look back at, at how this process went, you pointed out, and, and, and I concur, that I hope that I don't have to sit on another one of these, and I know you certainly don't want to. When you look back at this process, did, did you or should the House have learned anything from the way this was conducted, the way that this was put forward? Because it happens so infrequently, and because we have term limits, it isn't like, well, we are hopeful that it doesn't happen every right. six years or within a six-year period. So is there, is there some kind of a handbook you can write and leave behind for future legislators? Well, <coughs> excuse me, I, I certainly will, will maybe share my thoughts uh, when I step back a little bit. But, but I actually felt, and I, I know on the House floor there were comments about the process mm -hmm. and so forth, but I, I felt that it was a fair process. In fact, when I was questioning Representative uh, uh, of course, sir, the last question he was asked was mine, and it may not have been terribly uh, artfully presented, but, but I asked him about the process. Did you feel it was fair? And, and, and his response was, and I'm quoting, absolutely fair process. And so I felt, um, and, and we, weren't wearing a, we weren't wearing a prosecutorial hat, um, but I felt good with the two people who were most involved said it was a fair process. They were given the opportunity to present evidence. They were given the opportunity, uh, I think Representative Corser had three attorneys there. Uh, Representative Gamut was represented. And, and uh, you know the, the chairman of the committee, uh, and I know the chairman of the committee, and I think every member in the House of Representatives would say that uh, Representative McBroom, um, uh, when you think of the word integrity, you think of Representative McBroom. And uh, I know some of the comments made on the floor were, we're questioning the process and so forth, but I think when people step back, if you know this man, you know he is, uh, he's actually the dean of our caucus, which, which means uh, um, he's there as a counselor, an advisor, uh, uh, someone has an illness in the family, and, and, and both sides of the aisle. We had a, a Democrat member who lost a, a, a family member, and uh, Representative McBroom was reaching out, sending flowers and condolences to. So, so I felt that the selection of the chair uh, could not have been better. I know he, he uh, struggled with uh, the decisions that had to be made. He struggled with the entire process. But I think when we look back, um, it, it was a fair process. And, and again, if you, you have to make that judgment based on the charge that was given to the committee. I mean, I know people can say, well, you should have, and, and we heard it last night. Uh, in this morning, early this morning, saying, well, we need to know what the speaker knew and when the speaker knew it. And, and well, my response is, go back to the resolution that we adopted. We are, we are a society of rules. We are a government of rules. These were the rules. This was the charge to the committee. And that's what we were instructed to do by the House of Representatives. Um, I feel I'm convinced we did that. I point blank asked the two representatives who were being scrutinized, did you feel it was a fair process? And the response was yes. We're going to talk more about that process in just a moment. We're going to talk a little bit about what have we learned here and what do we know about the House of Representatives after this uh, very interesting week in Lansing. We're going to do that when we come back and have more to the point in just a moment. Welcome back to To The Point. Representative Rob Verhulen is my guest. Still hard not to call you mayor, but uh, <laughs> uh, you were mayor in Walker for a number of years. 
this is your second term. Now you served on this panel, the select committee, to look into the fitness of Representative Gamerit and Representative Corser. They are both now former representatives. Let's talk a little bit about what we learned from this in terms of what happens next in the House of Representatives, because this will air on Sunday. We've made a couple of references to last night and this morning as we're doing this on Friday, so it's all very fresh to both of us. You were in the chamber a lot longer than I was. I got a reprieve and left but not until I saw the unfolding situation where the vote to expel Representative Courser had been stalled because Democrats, many, uh, as many as two dozen, actually more than that, refused to vote. Not that they were voting against the resolution, but simply refused to vote. And you had to have a two-thirds vote in order for it to pass. Now, as a matter of record keeping, and of course, I want to point out, Ultimately, Representative Courser resigned. Representative Gamrat, in a separate vote, was expelled, so there is no confusion. But there was a vote to expel him that was held up because Democrats wouldn't vote. As the guy who was on the committee, who voted on the recommendations and sent them to the full House, what was the impact of that on you and your colleagues? Well, I, I can't speak for my colleagues, <coughs> but, but I, can, I can speak personally. I, I, I was very disappointed, to be honest. I, I, I am the whip of our caucus, which, which means I'm responsible for knowing where our members are in any particular issue. So if I'm doing my job well, I will know where the 60-plus Republicans are on a bill that's being voted on. Um, this was different. This, this vote is not a Republican vote and a Democrat vote. It's not a policy that's been adopted and advanced by the Republicans versus, in my mind, a vote of expulsion is a very personal thing and that each of the 109 members of the House of Representatives has to search his or her heart and mind and try to evaluate whether or not these two representatives um, are fit to continue holding the high office. That's not a Republican position. That's not a Democrat position. And so I was very disappointed when those Democrats, um, and I believe it was all Democrats who were withholding their vote, um, chose to, to engage in that practice. We, we have a rule in the House which requires if we're present, we vote. Our constituents are entitled to our vote. I didn't view a particular result as a victory uh, or a loss I would, uh, I wanted, because under the Constitution, it's, it's a collective judgment of the House of Representatives determining whether a particular representative is fit to, and that's not, uh, someone who agrees with me 100% on policy may take a totally different view, and that's what the Constitution provides. But to fail to vote is, is undermines the ability of our government to function. And if, if a member, uh, Democrat or Republican, said, I don't believe the process was thorough enough, then I would say, if you are not comfortable that this member should be expelled from the House of Representatives, then you should vote no. And you can do an explanation, and we have the technology to do right. that, and you can say, do not construe my no vote as a uh, 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 confirming or, or an uh, endorsement, an endorsement of, of, of this activity. behavior. It's the fact that I feel there were additional facts that hadn't been explored or, or what have you. But we have a, an obligation to vote. That's what we're there for. And to engage in this is, um, and I'm often very critical of how things function or don't function in Washington, D.C. And, and we haven't had that in the state of Michigan. We've been, our budgets are done on time. Uh, we may not like, and I guarantee you, uh, I voted now on three budgets. I can find fault with each and every one of those. But it's important that we, that we vote and that we make a determination and we move forward. And so to engage in a practice, and I'm not singling out any particular representative, but the practice of not voting is, number one, a violation of our rules. And number two, uh, this whole purpose or this whole unpleasant exercise is to try to restore public faith in their state government and I think those that practice undermines that public faith in government and it's very disturbing and so one of the lessons and I don't know how we address it I, I think we should have a commitment from both parties uh, and every member of the house to to follow the rules and when you're present cast a vote uh, because if we don't we're going to allow our, our ability to govern in Lansing 
uh, it's going to undermine that. And that undermines public faith in, in government, and that's very, very unhealthy for our state. I had a lot of people texting me, emailing me last night, asking me questions, even after I left the chamber. One of the questions was, well, why, if you didn't have the votes, wouldn't you vote instead for censure, which takes a simple majority, a two-thirds majority to expel, simple majority for censure, which can be very severe. Uh, I mean, it can, it can go a long way. And one of my responses and one of my, I, it's fair to say, concerns was that you have 90,000 people in the 80th and 90,000 people in the 82nd. And if you censure one or both of those representatives, those people end up effectively being censured as well. They receive the punishment as well as their representative because if you don't let them participate in committee meetings, serve on committees, do any of those kind of things that you would normally do, then their representation is limited. And I, so my, and I was only surmising, but I suggested that censure might actually be more damaging to the constituents than actually trying to replace uh, uh, a lawmaker. Was that no. part of the thought no. process? No, well, well, excuse me. It, it, it certainly was, and, and I wasn't in the uh, discussions or decisions to, to uh, keep the board open, that is not close right. the board and move on, but, but I, 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 just, I think we needed to vote. Every member of the House of Representatives, in my view, have, has a, a sacred obligation to cast his or her vote. And until that was done, I felt that we, we had to stay there until members exercised their obligation. And, and fortunately, that happened after many, many hours of delay. Um, but you're right. Uh, who are you damaging if you go with censure as opposed to expulsion? And again, if you go back to the charge, are they fit to continue holding the high office to which they're elected? And the judgment of the House of Representatives last night, bipartisan basis, uh, overwhelmingly was with respect to Representative Gamrit, um, she was not fit to continue to hold office. We've got about a minute left. What does this do to the House going forward? There are big issues out there. There are roads. There is a big energy plan that is very consequential. There might even be some kind of auto no-fault movement. All of those are big deals, and it's the kind of stuff that needs bipartisan cooperation. Can Republicans and Democrats now going forward say, all right, we've got some policy stuff to do, let's do it? Well, I certainly hope so. I, I, uh, here I do feel comfortable speaking for my caucus, the Republicans, that we understand. We, we were sent to Lansing to do a job, and that job includes, in the order I think you said it, we need to address roads. Um, energy policy is hugely important to the people of Michigan. No fault uh, has been on the agenda for years. It's very complex, but those things will take uh, a great deal of time and effort, and it will require a bipartisan effort. And, and uh, I feel, certainly with respect, I don't think there's a, a Republican position on energy versus a Democrat. I mean, you see, you see camps on all sides on the energy. Um, and I think to some extent roads too. We all agree we need to fix the roads. Um, uh, certainly uh, on our side there's probably a greater reluctance to raise taxes. Um, but I think we can find a solution. I think we will. We're all adults. We have, uh, despite being different parties, we have some wonderful personal relationships and I'm optimistic. I'm going to have you come back and talk about all that again. Next time though, I'm going to let you get some sleep first. Thank you for coming in on very little sleep. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing on this very important subject. You're welcome. And we're back with more To The Point in just a moment. We now know that the election to replace Representative Gamrat will be this November for the primary. The general will be in March. And finally, late Friday, I spoke with the former representative. With this issue largely behind her, I asked what she would say to her former constituents. I would say I'm sorry for any pain or hurt this has caused my district. And I, I have tried to do what steps I could to try to redeem the situation as best as I could. Um, if there's anything else I can do moving forward that helps in that way, um, I'm happy to do that. For now, at least, the coarser Gamrat affair is behind us. Next week, we'll talk about some important business that needs to be done in Lansing when you join us. To the point.